Right, I'll just, just do some, uh, some quick intros. So um, we're, we're lucky to be joined tonight by Emma Barnes. Um, Emma is our, uh, sorry, FA's Women and Girls Football Lead. Uh, but she's, she's here tonight as a, a volunteer, not in an official capacity. Um, so thanks for coming along. Um, Nick Ward. Nick is from Mole Valley Girls FC. Um, Nick is going to be going into a bit of detail around um, the sort of um, the challenges um, and user experience um, in designing their website and also some of the social media content. Um, Phil Rendell is Surrey FA's um, and like, like Emma, Phil's uh, again volunteered his time to be with us tonight and um, to just go through some of those. So thanks to Phil for joining us. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, April from Hype Marketing is here. Um, thanks to April for on this session. I, I'm handing most of the proceedings over to <laughs> April. Um, but just a bit of context, uh, Hype Marketing have been sponsoring girls football in Surrey this season. They've been doing some, some really great stuff with us. Um, not, not least organising sessions like this, um, but there will also be some resources that will be sent out uh, following this session. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll come on to over the course of the presentation. Um, other than that, I think what we'll do now is hand straight over to Emma, and Emma's just going to give us a bit of an outline over the, the growth of female football as a whole and in Surrey. Thanks, James. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. Perfect, okay. So just really to set the scene a little bit, um, so obviously the women's game has grown massively over recent years, as you'll all be aware of. And last season, or the beginning of this season, the FA launched the um, FA Player, where you can actually watch live games, which is fantastic. It's really helped with getting the message out and allowing people to access and view the, the um, matches, which is brilliant. Um, you'll see there on the the slide that 12 million people tuned in to watch the World Cup semi-final when we played the USA last year in France. Unfortunately, we all know the outcome of that one. But, um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's brilliant that that amount of people did tune in to watch that. And also in November last year, they had a, a women's weekend where they encouraged male clubs to get the women to the grounds and to use those grounds to get as many people there offering discount tickets and the record crowd there was actually Arsenal and Tottenham. That was played at the new Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. So 38,000 um, spectators in the ground is a really, really good exhibition to get the message out there. Premier Leagues have also started to launch their um, kits alongside the women. So you would have seen a lot of publicity going out where they've got the male and the female players next to each other showcasing the kits, which is a really positive thing as well. And recently as well, you may have heard about the Barclays sponsorship. Um, so £10 million into the WSL League. So it's the Barclays WSL League now, which is fantastic. So a few stats on how, how the numbers have really grown. So you'll see there in 1993, there was 10,500 women playing football, which I guess at that point in time sounds like a, a great number. If you compare it to where we're at now, it's really, really grown. So in 2018, it's in, from 2018 to 2019, it's increased from 2.63 million women. That's 16 plus, and it's increased by 1.7 million, which again is really, really impressive. And it can show that we can keep growing the game further and further. So since the World Cup last year in France, which I'm sure you all tuned into, there's 850,000 more women in the sport, which again, I think will continue to grow. So on a local level, we've actually um, exceeded our targets, which we've been set as Surrey FA, which I'll go on to on the next slide already. And um, so I'll go into that in a little bit more detail for you to show that. Um, but we've been working on some projects this year as well, where we're now actually doing some really great work around groups that maybe can't access football or haven't had the opportunity to access football as much. So we've done a project at HMP Downview, which you'll see the um, picture there. So we've been engaging the female inmates in recreational football and they've gone through a part of a coaching course as well. And they're really, really keen to get playing as much as they can. We've also run a number of level one courses too. The most recent one we ran at uh, Meadowbank 
and I think there was 23 participants as well, which again, really, really good numbers on that. So the next slide, you just pop that over for me, April. It's got some figures on here for you and I won't, I won't bore you too much with them, but you will see the key one on the right hand side here. It says 902 and I've circled that in red. So our target for this season was 4,602. Oh, sorry, that's our current, sorry, 4,602, and our target is 3,700. So we're actually 902 individual participants above that level at the moment, which is really, really great news. And again, it shows how strong female football is in Surrey and is a reflection of how it is across the country as well. Thanks, April. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good point, and that's sort of what we're trying to do here really is, is help clubs set themselves up to almost be able to to better deal with that demand um, and probably at the end of the sort of the, the situation at the moment it's going to be an even bigger demand to to get out and play football once, once we hit. so, <laughs> so um, I'm going to hand over to April now who's going to go through um, some slightly more technical stuff um, some of you may be aware of some of this stuff um, but likewise uh, if, if you if you gain one thing from this, then hopefully, hopefully that's really helpful. I'm sure you'll gain a lot more. I hope so. So, um, <laughs> first of all, I want to talk to you guys a little bit more about best practice. I uh, apologise if my slides go here and there whilst I do this. Um, it's only my second time actually hosting a proper webinar, so we'll see how that goes. Um, so, I just wanted to really cover some basics here to help you reach the right audience uh, and a few things to think about when you might have more time at the moment. Uh, whilst we act, can't be playing football. So the first thing that I wanted to cover with you guys is actually some key terms on Google Analytics. Uh, now, I know it sounds really, really scary, uh, and I hope most of you are using it, but kind of like James said, I have created a document that has everything on this, everything on there for you, so it's gonna be quite easy, hopefully after this, be to put it into practice. So the first thing with Google Analytics is understanding the lingo. So if you have a look here, you've got users. So that is going to be the total number of people that have visited your website in a date range. Uh, you've got your new users, which kind of speaks for itself. They're their first time visitors to your website. Uh, sessions is the total number of sessions. They kind of think of it like a football session. Um, it's how, when they've been on there. Uh, and the number of sessions per users is if I kept returning to your site, that number would go up and you'd be able to see that there. Uh, page views is the amount the total amount of page views that your website has seen. So these might also be repeated again. Um, average session duration, so how long they've actually spent on your website, looking around it. Uh, then you've got your bounce rate here, which is people who've come on and looked at kind of one page on your website and they haven't taken an action. So it might be that they've come on to see um, a training time and then jump back straight off. Or it might be that that content isn't relevant for them. It's quite a hard one to gauge. Um, but kind of the more you dive into the analytics, the more it will be apparent. Um, and then the last one is new versus returning visitors. So depending on the content of your site and what you're using your website for, that's really gonna, those are gonna change. Um, so they're all kind of indications of how your website is actually performing. So for the, if I'm completely honest, everything on this slide is kind of the level that you guys really I don't feel like you need to go into much more detail um, for what you're looking at, but I have provided a, a link to Google Academy that teaches you a little bit more in depth stuff in terms of looking at filters and reporting, but for your audience, like I said, I just don't think that's necessary. The only thing that could be quite useful is the acquisition part of the website down here. So this bit just tells you where you're getting, where how people are finding you. So you have organic search, which is search engines, direct straight into the browser. Referral could be a link from a different site. Paid search, if anybody, if you're using PPC and, and social um, and display again, is also uh, another paid use. Um, I suppose for you guys, it's gonna be having a look at it and thinking, you know, everybody's coming through directs, they've already heard about us, maybe you wanna start building up and getting people to come to your website through social. So you can kind of semi-monitor your marketing efforts here um, and kind of push to achieve different things as well. Um, but I thought it'd be quite useful for you guys to have a little look at that um, and kind of understand what everything means um, to a slightly better level. 
So one of the things that is really important for any website, no matter what the purpose of the website for, is going to be your user journey. Um, so I'm going to start off with page structure and it kind of rolls into the next little bits as well. So it's a bit of an interesting one. What you need to think about is how users are finding the content and how accessible it is. So I've used Sorry FAs as an example here. Um, as you can see, it's clearly labeled at the top. I'm hoping you can all see my mouse, by the way. Um, it's clearly labeled at the top. So we've got players. If I'm a player, I know to go to this section. If I'm a coach, if I'm a referee. And then we've got further drop downs here. So it's really, really easy for me to find the information that I'm looking for. And it's just kind of effort effortless. I don't need to fish around for the information. Now, you don't obviously need to have quite so many different labels. Um, for what you're doing but it's a really clear path for your users and this is going to help your seo and it's going to improve the metrics we just spoke about um because more people are going to have be spending time on your site because they've easily found the information that they need um they're not going to be hunting around for it getting bored and then jumping off to go somewhere else for instance um and that kind of then leads me into the the parents versus player um and we were speaking about this a couple of weeks ago but for me, I think it's a really key topic for especially under 16s football in general and within the girls game because they're kind of their journey to the sport is quite different to, to the boys journey to the sport. So you need to be thinking about who is going to be seeing that information and who are you targeting. Are you looking for your websites to be more focused on the parents or is it going to be on the players? So from my own experience, um, I found the clubs and then my parents took me. So it, Typically, I'll get it through a recommendation from a friend, but I would be the one going and looking for them online and finding that information for training. So I'd definitely suggest having a little bit of a sit down and think about how you've recruited new players in the past. Uh, and especially for those that, of you that have quite a few teams, it's also going to be, it might be good for have a section purely for parents as well, especially for kind of the, the more little ones on there, as it's definitely not going to be them finding the information. Um, but I've got a little bit, more to talk to you about later in terms of different demographics and what to look for and kind of who's on the internet uh, for instance um, but yeah just a bit of food for thought there about your content and what people are, are going through which leads me on to seo so it's a bit of a mysterious topic it's always changing but there's you know there's a few things that i can give to you guys that will give your clubs that little bit more oomph i call it um so google tends to be the typical platform that everybody's using. They've now made it a noun. Uh, so I thought covering the basics here would be a good starting point. Um, and again, all of these different points I've kind of bolted out onto how you can set them up within the resource pack for you. Um, so don't worry if you're panicking about it. So we're gonna start with Google My Business. Now in simple terms, it's the box that shows up on the right with all the information in and the pictures. So it has the opening times, your address, that kind of stuff. Um, but it's going to be really beneficial for you guys to have, have it for your club as it validates to Google that your club actually exists as well. Um, something that I've learned from doing marketing is Google is very suspicious and you have to keep telling it that you do what you do and you're really credible. Um, so if you're keeping this really up to date, um, it can also support you coming up in the match feed on the map feature. So if you're typing in like football clubs near me, you're gonna be more likely to appear in that ranking box now. And um, people are lazy, so they're more likely to click on one of those than scroll through the pages and do a bit of research. Um, so that was a really, really key one for you guys to um, definitely register for if you haven't got it yet. The next one is Google Alerts. Um, it's quite a clever tool. Not many people actually use Google Alerts. Um, the first thing I'm going to say is it's not going to directly influence where you rank on Google, but it's a great tool to monitor who was talking about your club online and key topics that are going on in football at the moment. So how I use it for hype marketing is I'm seeing who's talking about us and the hot topics again within marketing to make sure we're always at the forefront of new technology and ideas. So in your kind of how that would translate to you guys, you might have, um, the local newspaper posts about your game on Saturday online, there's something then you can promote through your social channels. And if they haven't linked to your website, you can ask them to. And that then it's that little link, which is gonna then help boost your SEO because it's cementing your authority as that football club and building the credibility with Google that you, you're doing what you do. Um, so it's a really good one to kind of stay on top of that. Uh, the other side of it, 
kind of fits into the keeping up to date information. So you can use this tool, for instance, to update your website with the latest guidance from Surrey FA or, or keeping out an eye for new drills at training. Um, it's quite an all encompassing thing that can benefit you guys in many ways, but it just doesn't mention, um, it doesn't pick up mentions in social. That's the only thing I will say. Um, so don't expect to see like if somebody comments on Twitter for it to ding you an alert. Um, it's purely kind of online stuff um, there. But again, really valuable tool. I use it all the time. Uh, use set it up to send you emails as well. Um, so you don't have to go in there and look, you'll just get it dinged to you and it's super easy. Now, we're just gonna look at keeping the information up to date. I know it sounds a tad obvious, but you'll be surprised about how many businesses don't actually do this. It's gonna be simple things such as your training times, costings, contact number, numbers, locations, they're all vital. However, to kind of help with that SEO ranking, I would probably advise you guys to revise your copy every three months. It doesn't have to be anything massive, but if you have a, do some little twe tweaks, you're basically telling Google that it's still an active website and Google will favor websites that regularly like post new content. So it can be as simple as changing a few words on the post um, and you could see some, some positive rankings there as well. Um, so moving on then to kind of the more on-page, off-page SEO. We've covered quite a bit of it in terms of keeping your website up to date and changing the content. Um, but one of the things that everybody kind of needs to be mindful of is using keywords. Um, I could talk all day about this kind of stuff, but I thought I'd keep it super simple. So things like girls football is a keyword everybody should be using throughout your text. Um, and if you have any blogs on your website, it'll be good to link these from other pages on your website as well as there's kind of it attributes to your rankings if you've got internal linking and it will improve your user journey. So to do you an example, if you have got um, training on one page, you might have a blog about some really good training sessions that you could link to at the bottom there. And it's just giving that, giving people that it, those little bits to find more information about it. Um, so they're, they're really clued up basically. Um, and that then moves us onto the technical side. Um, just going to whiz through that super quickly as you might have your head full of ideas or slightly overwhelmed by the sheer volume of information I'm giving you. Um, but the technical SEO is all about optimizing your site and site structure for search engine to crawl, index, and understand your website quickly and efficiently. So basically, the short of that is you need to make it really clear what your site is about. So you cover the content and page structures. The next part which is quite vital is going to be your site speed. Um, again, I have a link in the resources so you guys can check, check this on your own site, um, but it kind of all falls back into that full kind of topic of user journey. So if your website's taking too long for somebody to load, somebody's more likely to bounce back off it. Um, so a few kind of little tips you can do for your load speed is making sure that your image sizes are quite small um, and the amount of redirects you have on your website are just limited. That might be where you change um, the URL structure or anything on your site um, by accident or not. It's just kind of getting rid of them uh, and starting again. The next common problem I see with all businesses as well is meta descriptions. So this is the text that pops up in the search engine under the title page. You want to make sure that each of your pages has a different meta description related to the content on that page and it's engaging for the reader so that it's more likely for them to click on it. Plus, it then verifies to Google that your page is talking about what your page actually says it does. Um, a little bit complicated, but they do make a massive difference. Then the last thing is uh, your SSL certificates. Um, so definitely, if you take anything away from the session, go and double check you have one. It ensures the safe passing of information from users to merchants. So if you take a look at the Google Chrome browser, for instance, in the top left, you're going to have that lock in the corner. Uh, and if you don't have a lock, it's broken. A lot of people don't trust those websites now and Google favors everybody that does have one. And they've taken quite a few steps into making it hard to access websites that don't have an SSL now. Um, so yeah, 100% do that. It's going to give parents a lot more confidence in your clubs if they can provide you information securely to through your website. Um, so yeah, that's, that's definitely my, my top 
my top tip out of all of this. Uh, I'm now going to pass you over to Nick, who is going to then talk to you a little bit about kind of their user journey and everything. So let me click on it so it goes through. Here we go. Here we go. Hello. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good. <laughs> a thumbs up would have done. Um, so uh, here you can see on this slide, this is just um, a sort of indicator of the, the sort of journey we've taken. Uh, there's two, um, two bits of information that we put out. On the left-hand side is a flyer that came out when I first joined Mole Valley Girls for, um, just for a trial session. You can see we've got the, uh, the old logo of the club there, um, the bits of clip art, um, photo. The information there is fine. I don't, you can't really see it on this slide there, but down the bottom, the email is, uh, is a sort of hotmail one, um, and the, um, the website is... Uh, club website forward slash mobile well, you know it's a it's kind of a generic club website um, and but then we've got the nice little England logo in the corner uh, and obviously someone's put a lot of sort of time and energy into this but it's got lots of different fonts being used it's got some co comic there I think it's got um, lots of things to try and make it look more interesting but the overall result I think people are being more exposed to images on a daily basis now and there's a sort of a bigger expectation now for clubs um, to look more professional in what they put out. Um, so we, when we started off, I'm lucky my daughter's a really lovely graphic designer. Um, and she was able to work with me um, in terms of just clearing our image up as a club. Um, so one of the first things we did was, um, if you look in the bottom right-hand corner of that little um, flower on the right-hand side, you can see we've got the new logo down there. Um, it's just the same logo, essentially, the Dorking Cock and Leatherhead Swan. Um, with the acorns in it, we kept all of the uh, points of reference and just cleaned it up, made it a lot cleaner um, and, and generally more attractive in, in an image. We lost the stars because it's a bit hackneyed. You know, we've got more girls coming through now. We haven't got one team that's doing well. We've got lots of teams that are doing well. And, you know, how many stars can you have on a logo? Um, and then we started to look at our internal, um, the internal stuff we we're going to do. Now, um, we're going to talk about that later on, I think, about, um, about you know marketing social media uh, campaigns and whatnot but the only thing I'd uh, point out here is that if you look to the bottom left hand corner you've got uh, will at mvgfc.co.uk so now we've got our own website people can choose to go to go to that uh, we've all got those points of reference it's not complicated obviously it's just on the website it forwards on to his email at home so he doesn't we don't have her to run an outlook server or anything like that just forwards it on and then he can reply to any emails that come to him um, and then there's something that I'd ask you to take note of. In the top left-hand corner, we've got Mole Valley Women FC. So this is obviously trials for the women's team. When the logo and the things were created on the left-hand side, we had one team, uh, I think it was under nines, it was formed, I think it was part of uh, um, Dorking Football Club. And we had one team that, um, that went on to become as many teams as we've got now. And at the time, Mole Valley Girls FC made an awful lot of sense. But we hadn't really thought about how we were going to present when we had women playing for us. We'd become Mole Valley ladies, Mole Valley girls, Mole Valley, we've got beach on bars up the road. Um, and, and so we didn't really think about the future image of the club. When we started to building our brand, if you like, I think it's probably what this is most about. When we started building our brand, we then had to really think about how we wanted to appear to the outside world in terms of being friendly, in terms of being amenable, in terms of being professional. Um, and so that, that was really the thrust of all of this, was to just try and create... Um, to create an image of the club when people came into contact with it they thought we can trust our kids to go there we can we know they're going to get a, a decent service down there um, if if you wouldn't mind going on to the next um, page is there anything else you want to talk about on this one no that's good all right so um, so this is our website now once we had done all of those internal things we created our own different campaigns and we realized that we weren't really getting a response. We were putting a lot of time, a lot of energy into our flyers. We weren't really getting the response we anticipated. Um, and so we decided to invest money as a club. Um, we pay, just to give an idea of cost, we pay about 150 pounds a year for a hosted, web, um, a, a hosted WordPress website. Um, and we paid for a, um, a bit of software. I bought it, um, my, daughter, you know, my daughter's a graphic designer. She's not a, a web designer by any means. But we were able to kind of work our way through it 
and we bought a bit of software called Divi and that sits within a WordPress website and it means it makes it very easy to do things like get a nice clean image up there, get the text up there. And I'm just going to take you, talk you through a few of these components that you've got in front of you here. Um, as you had April talking about earlier, you've got the metata metadata. Metadata is a description of something, but it's no less important than, than the actual text that you're putting on your website. And in many ways, perhaps the website information, the, the writing that you've got on the website is more important. So within that first paragraph, it says, we're Mole Valley Girls. It's a statement straight away. The website's more MVGFC. Um, I can't remember. It's like the tab, the underline says girls football in the, meta, in the description next to it. It says uh, the home of girls football. Um, and it's... Uh, it just, you know, it's, it's important that, that, that those things are so important. Because if you were interested in girls football, this is where you want to come. Um, and in that first paragraph, it says where we play, we play in Leatherhead. We're interested in Leatherhead, Dorking, Ashford. Sorry, we play in Dorking. Um, but we're interested in, in all the main areas of Mole Valley. Um, and all of that information is in that, is in that first paragraph. And that's really quite important. Um, and then if you look down, you've got three columns there. And at each, the bottom of each column is what you call a call to action, a button. Um, one is women's team, one is tell me more. Um, I, I don't suppose uh, we've got access to the website, have we? But then if you scroll down, there's, a, there's just a contact sheet. And up in the top right-hand corner, there's the links. And really that makes it the, the access to the rest of the website as, as easy as possible. Um, we were talking earlier about bounce rate. Uh, or we were talking about all the different metrics, all the different things you can find out from Google. The key figure that I look to is bounce rate because obviously um, I don't want to have all the information on that front page. We've got lots of people looking for different things. Um, and a bounce rate is the indicator to me that the website is doing, doing its job well. Uh, just to give an idea, a good bounce rate is a percentage. Is anything below about 50%? If you're getting bounce rates above 50%, that means that more than half the people that are coming are looking at your homepage. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but really we want people to dwell a little bit longer to be a little bit more intrigued and to be looking a bit further into our website so any bounce rate over uh, under 50 percent is a good thing um, and that means that people are coming to your website and going from your website onto another link um, ideally within the website um, so that that and that's really how we we try and set up and that's that's the principles that we followed were that we wanted to invest a little bit of money into the whole website we didn't have if you go to pitch hero they offer a great service um, and they offer a really nice tool and I think you can look at lots of clubs neighbors of ours that have done a great job with pitch hero but the problem with that then is that you're getting adverts in there that you don't necessarily advocate um, and you don't really get any income from that either and we didn't want to just confuse the the page with that um, I, in terms of our search engine optimization we went from having um, you know no visitors what effectively to the website or not many visitors to the website to having uh, multiple visits a week and we were getting round about when we were busy right right at the beginning of the year just after the world cup uh, we were getting maybe 10 between 10 and 20 queries a week uh, from girls wanting to play football and we went from having the year the girls that i coached that we i'm fortunate enough to coach we were was the first time that they had two age groups was two seasons ago uh, two teams at one age group and this this year we've got now three seasons under three teams at one age group at the under 11 so it's had a massive impact on our ability to build teams and now now our problem is is capacity we're looking at having to build up uh, get more coaches to get to get the girls going um to make sure that they're getting that positive experience and still keeping at that 16 to 1 coach ratio for the club so so really it's been a really massive success for us as a club to have a good website and although the branding journey was very very important to us to make sure that we had that clean branding making sure we had a consistent font that was used. It's not been an easy journey and we didn't do everything right on that. But even so, that we had to do that journey and that's not the end of the world if that doesn't work very well. But what is important is that the website does tick all those boxes in terms of being clean, accessible and meaningful to the, to the viewer. I think that's it's all right for the moment. Yeah, no, that was lovely. Um, that's, that's brilliant. And just sort of uh, to go back, I mean, we, we talked about the Surrey FA website um, and, you know, there are some positives on the Surrey FA website, but there's also plenty of negatives. Um, and, and obviously we're, we're sort of aiming at a very different audience. Um, but in terms of having those, those kind of clear calls to action, uh, you, can, you can see that very much on display here. Um, what we would try to do, if we're putting out um, a sort of an article, for example, we'll always try and have a call to action at the end of that. So if it's an article about coaching, 
we might link away to something about getting involved in coaching or signing up to an event, for example. Um, so it's just just important. And everyone in the office will, will take the mic out of me because I bang on about calls to action. But it is, is so important because it's the kind of, okay, what next? What's the next step? Um, and it really, really is important to keep your, your bounce rate as low as possible, keep people on your website for as long as possible. Um, I don't know if anyone um, had any questions sort of around around this section. Um, obviously, we'll have the Q and A at the end. But if anyone did have anything specific, um, I think we've got one from Emma, um, who says, "Does Mole Valley use social media channels for recruitment, or is the website stronger?" I don't know. I know we're going to come on to that in a minute, Nick, around the social media stuff, but. So sort of what? What's it, I mean, it, it's, that's a tough one to ask. I mean, we do use social media, of course, and we, we are going to come onto it later, and you'll see an, an example of how we've done that. And I, I think if you go, you know, going back to the slide, you, you can see that we um, we still put stuff out on social media. But um, uh, really, the way I see it, at least, is that social media is a way to to, to drive people towards websites. It's about generating, um, you know, leads, if you like, at the, on the website. So that's the social media is about that general buzz, keeping people connected to the club, a sense of belonging, having a relationship with the club. But in terms of a dynamic tool um, around making, you know, recruitment, it's very hit and miss social media, and it's it, it's its own challenge. And the thing is about website is someone feels like doing it at three in the morning, they can have a look. Two in the afternoon or at nine o'clock on a Thursday lunch, you know, evening, they can have a look. Um, so, so yeah, we do use social media, but um, a lot of our contacts come through the, the website, the contact form. Thanks, Nick. I think that might be what you're coming on to next. I could be yeah. wrong, Nick. Social media is next. Okay. Yeah, social media best practice, like everybody knows. Um, Cool. So first of all, and I'm really sorry if the uh, headers are doing that for everyone where they keep flashing. I have no idea what that is. Um, I just wanted to, to run past some scary figures and it's going back to that players versus parents mentality as well. Um, so when you guys are looking at to what social channels you should utilize, um, Twitter has 330 million active users uh, every month. So it's really quick. It's a good tool for quick reach, but you've got to remember that Twitter has a really small um, kind of lead time on it so we can get lost really quickly. Facebook has 2.35 billion active users, and I'm sure that's gone up a little bit since we've uh, gone into lockdown. So it's quite good for reaching and promoting to consumers. And then you've got Instagram with 1 billion active monthly users, which is going to be better for reaching that younger audience. Um, the, yeah, it's pretty scary to see how quickly all of these have, have kicked off, but it's, it's really good to kind of have that mentality when you're looking at where you're actually going to post when we look at social media. So if we jump onto the demographics and look at who's on which platform, you can see that Facebook is going to be the best place to be reaching parents because um, they predominantly dominate that kind of section. And then if we look at Instagram, they're going to be placed to get your younger players and we've got a bit of section on safeguarding in a little bit which is going to be quite key when, when thinking about your content so when you're posting out your different campaigns it will be good to have a look at where where these people are sitting on which social platform to make sure that you grab them um so they're seeing the right the right stuff basically um and then again you've got to look at the male and female side so i'm not sure what it's like now, but when I was playing football about 10 years ago, it was always my dad that took me. My mum didn't want anything to do with it. I mean, she probably still doesn't. Um, but he was the one that kind of took me there. Okay, albeit he's not on social media and he's scared of his phone. But if you kind of have a think of your demographics, your club and who brings who and how that's all changing, then you'll know kind of with those two different graphs exactly where to post the content and how to angle it. I know that Nick said on their kind of tone of voice and the website was very much friendly mum. So then using that across your social channels, but if you know that a different campaign or different Im imagery is gonna resonate better with a male audience, it's doing that as well. Um, it's all very complicated with the science behind it, but hopefully that will give you a bit more, more thought behind when you're posting, what you're posting and where you're posting. Um, 
So first of all, I just wanted to kind of jump into the how you guys can date, engage with your clubs at the moment. So we're looking at coach, Coaches Social, uh, and Peter has been putting out some fantastic stuff on Twitter, getting some really good engagement from the actual FA himself. Um, I strongly advise you all jumping on there and having a look at him. But one of the things that he's doing, other than keeping players engaged with the game, is he's building his own personal brand as well. Um, they're all really fun. They're ways to kind of keep the skill levels up and motivation within the teams. Uh, and one of the key things he's done here is actually tagged other accounts like the FA, like Surrey FA and FA Learning. Now, what this does, particularly in, well across all social channels, is it brings out that reach and it gives you guys more chances to be seen by new audiences. Um, so sorry if they retweeted their sort of the FA, I think FA learning, I think they all did, which then brings them out into their audience. Um, and as well as using that, that hashtag football staying home. So anybody who's looking for sport or football online um, on Twitter, he's going to then pop up. Um, so it's a really great way for your coaches to kind of stay involved and also build up their personal brands and the club's brand at the same time. Uh, one of my favourite things that Peter has done here, and I'm hoping that is from James drilling it into him, is he's put capitals at the start of all of his words within his hashtag. So if somebody's using dictation because uh, they're visually impaired, then the Alexas and all of that kind of stuff is going to pick it up and read it. So it's just friendly um, and inclusive of everyone, uh, which is lovely to see a lot of more people are starting to do that now. Um, it's really nice. Let's dive in, a couple of very quick tips, uh, one, of, one of which I had to teach Pete. Um, so if, if you want your tweet to be seen by everyone on your feed, um, you, it, don't start it with an at. So don't start it with at Surrey FA, don't start it at, at BBC, uh, because then it will only be seen by that particular person um, or others that you've tagged into that tweet. Um, and just another little hack that we use, obviously you're, you're limited for characters on Twitter. Um, you can't do this with videos, but you can do it with, um, with images. Uh, you can actually tag 10 accounts in to any photo and you can kind of do that just invisibly. So if we've got something going out um, that we, want, we maybe want to be shared quite widely, we might want it to be shared by leagues, for example. Um, we'll tag in lots of leagues. Uh, we might tag in the FA. Um, any other kind of relevant accounts. So it's just a just a little hack, um, you know, trying to make sure you use that that real real estate of the tweet as best you can, really. Fabulous. Sorry, I just broke the presentation, everyone. I think. <laughs> Sorry, I, I came in at the right time. <laughs> yeah, you did. Yeah, no, that that's great, James. And you're gonna have to put that in an email to me so I remember that as well because that was the first I've ever heard of it. So that's great. Um, <laughs> Next, I just wanted to kind of cover use of imagery um, and you saw that we're going to go back to Nick after this. Um, so Sutton United Women's FC, when I was kind of looking through everybody in kind of Surrey FA's girls remit, um, their social media really, really stood out for me. Um, and it's because of the use of their imagery that they've used. Um, so they're all really consistent. You can see there that all of their images are yellow. It's Sutton's yellow. Uh, so it's all very on brand. Um, and you'll notice that they have different, they have their other handles on the on their tweets as well on some of them. Um, so it's the top left one under the use of imagery. That way it kind of, it shows that they're on different channels. Somebody might prefer to follow them somewhere else. I thought that was a really, really clever thing that they did there. Um, and it's going to help them increase their engagement on those channels as well. Um, their fonts, going back to what Nick said, are all really consistent across what they're doing. Um, they look like they've got quite some serious branding there with different um, kind of font weights, but you don't need to worry about that, be fine. Um, and the information stands out on the images. So whilst you're scrolling down, if you're scrolling through your feed, you pick out the key information straight away, um, which is also gonna catch your eye as well including they've got kind of register for trials by emailing ladies at suttonunited.net. I didn't even read that tweet when I saw it, but thought that was a great image. Um, going back onto the actual content within your tweets, um, I love that Sutton use, a, use yellow hearts because that's very on brand as well. Um, and it, everything's very friendly. All of the tone of voice is the same. The only things that I feel like they, they could do a little bit better 
is, I mean, today's starting lineup, again, there isn't really a call to action there for anybody to do anything with it. Whether it necessarily needs one is arguable. Um, but then they also, they're not very consistent with their hashtags either on getting that kind of promotion out there. So when they're playing Crystal Palace, it would have been quite good for them to tag Crystal Palace in it, use a hashtag. Um, this is Surrey Football was a really good one that we've been using recently, um, uh, as well as some, some other ones that they can think of. If you look at their interview has been moved to 7.30, you can see that they've, they've used more hashtags there and they've probably got a lot more reach. Um, so I would just say, just make sure all of your material has the same tone and you all come across as the same club. Uh, I'm sure quite a few people like with our Twitter actually manage your social accounts. Uh, it's just making sure that everybody sounds the same uh, and there's no spelling mistakes in there. Uh, consistency is really key. And that is something I, um, I preach a lot, whether I'm actually personally consistent, I'm not sure, <laughs> but when we're doing company stuff, um, and we're representing a brand, um, it, it's really, really important uh, to, to get that across. So I think I'm handing back to Nick now, wherever my mouse is, to change the slide. I'll just quickly say, obviously, looking at, at the stuff that Sutton are putting out, it might, might look a bit daunting. Um, and I know that um, Sutton women are lucky enough to have a graphic designer, I think, as their club captain. Um, but we're going to come on to that a bit later. We've got some, some, some bits and bobs that will hopefully help help you out yeah. with that side of things. I've just realised I've got another slide. <laughs> I think my presentation's... Ah, there we go. So, stay-at-home challenges, which is a really quick one I wanted to cover. Um, so, I thought both of these posts were really, really good. Um, the match of the day post is more to give you guys a little bit more inspiration and keeping your clubs engaged with you. Um, they are doing these girls at home, stay-at-home challenges all the time. So, if you're thinking... Um, everybody needs a bit of a pick-me-up or something fun to do and you're kind of struggling with what to do uh, I'd advise maybe jumping on the match of the days kind of goals at home challenge uh, and I absolutely love their use of emojis in it it's really engaging it's going to appeal to um, every, the players as well as parents as it's all friendly like that kind of style uh, and then I just wanted to, to show that Epsom and Wells have also done a really good one as well um, if you guys get a chance, definitely have a look at it um, and see what they've done. It's just, it's something fun and engaging um, and everybody's used good, good hashtags and that kind of thing. But I just thought it was uh, good to highlight for everyone. So now I'll hand you back to Nick. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, um, I mean, this, uh, particularly people uh, who are coaches or working within any kind of football club, um, you know, we know one of the, prat the practical issues are that on that every team is like a small kind of island in its own right, potentially with a manager who knows what they want to do in the drills, um, etc. And if not uh, um, in a team, then definitely at each age group. Um, and that becomes one of the issues is that people will use Facebook, will use the hashtags or will po post stuff on your Facebook homepage that's not necessarily on brand. Uh, we need you to join our football team. For example, it's the wrong green, it's the wrong font, but it no criticism of anybody they're looking to try and get someone's attention but and and it's not you've got our logo or anything like that but but it is um being posted on on a on a Marvel Valley girls uh, website and that's really one of our one of the enduring struggles if you're too anal about the whole marketing kind of things and being really really fixated on having consistent imagery and consistent logo which I personally, I think it's in, it's nice to be able to have a sort of go-to point of reference. But if other things kind of slip slip out that aren't that aren't ideally on brand, let's face it, we we're doing grassroots football. We're not we're not multi-million pound sort of uh, businesses, um, and so it can be difficult keeping things um, consistent. But um, on the right-hand side, there, you, what you've got is this is a campaign that my daughter conceived of um, because, like I say, she's a graphic designer. Was trying, who was just kind of twiddling her thumbs at the time, and so she decided she wanted, to, she wanted to help us do a campaign for recruitment. We put lots of energy, we went out, did these photos, got the, spent lots of time looking at different kind of, um, different images and the way that the, the image was put together. Um, you should notice obviously those images are square and I'd point out that's something that is worth thinking about. The idea of having something in landscape or portrait is kind of moot because the best social media things you can put out, generally speaking, are square they sit on the page best certainly for instagram um 
you can see we've got the, the image, the messaging there. Um, thank you, Emma. Um, we've got the, uh, image, the messaging there about uh, kickballs. It's like a strong kind of feminist message to girls who are going to be wake up and stand up, stand up against, the, um, against the boys game kind of thing. Um, it's got the nice Nike logo in the corner there, the England logo in the corner there, and it's got that centralised, it's got a very clear kind of strong England kind of cross in the middle there. But you can still see we've, we've, um, we've got marvalleygirlssc.co.uk, Mar so our, 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 our website wasn't quite as clean, but then we've got all the social media things on there as well. We threw that out there, we put that up, um, we tried to create posters, we got them put on in shop windows, um, and we got barely any response from it whatsoever. And we invested probably as much time in the kickballs campaign as we did do in the website itself, which, which, you know, gave us so much more reward. Um, so social media is good. It can be fantastic for building a following, for connecting with people if they're already friends. But you are largely preaching to the choir. You're largely talking to people that are already interested in you, potentially already following you. Um, and, it, and whilst it could have the potential to go viral, and I think that's what people kind of aspire to, you've got to bear in mind that, However many clubs out there, they're all, they're all wanting to do something that's going to go viral. And the chances of anything you're doing going viral, no matter how much energy you put into it, are slim to none. Um, so really, you, you, I would say that whilst it's nice to do nice social, social media things, um, it's more about putting things out regularly, having something there um, that's consistent for your people, the, your followers, to make it so that you're continuing to be relevant to them. Um, and, and having this, this idea of... A call to action might sound like a bit sort of gimmicky, but this idea of doing it for a reason, having a point to what you're doing so that you can then work out whether or not you've achieved it. And if you haven't, then think again and maybe go back to it and think, how could I achieve that? Um, and in this case, we're talking recruitment, um, but it could be fundraising, it could be barbecues, it could be internal, it could be external, it could be about profile. Um, and then it's about working out, going back to the, to the, um, to the graphs of whether you're going to get to the right age group. Um, and, and yeah, and that, and that voice, like, um, like I said earlier, my, I tried to find the inner um, sort of middle-aged mum in me to try and write the text on the, the copy on the, on the website so that I could be both consistent in what I was writing and try and strike the right tone. Um, that wasn't, obviously it wasn't easy to do that, but I, it's unreasonable for me to expect all my colleagues on the, in My Valley Girls to be able to find that same voice. So I don't, I don't bust a nut about that. I just, I'm just, I've got that that kind of light, easy point of reference, but, it, but I'm not killing myself and I'm certainly not falling out with anybody in the club over it. Um, so everybody can do their own thing, but at the same time, we have got a sort of touchstone in terms of knowing that we can produce very strong, beautiful, clean images, but that, that's not the be all and end all of what everything we're trying to do. Um, it's all right, is there anything else you wanted me to say about that? No, that's, that's brilliant, unless, unless there's any questions at this stage for Nick. Um, otherwise, we might save save those for the end because I'm obviously conscious of time. Um, for those that want to stay on for the Q and A, so um, should we move on? Sorry, I forgot that was me that had to press the button. To <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, going to hand over now to Phil, who's just going to give a really, really brief overview for us, just on on some of the kind of the safeguarding issues to be aware of. Um, in the digital landscape, obviously, um, there, there's lots of positives to it, but there's also things that, that we need to be cautious of in the, in this space. So, Phil, I'll hand over to you. Okay, I actually have got some slides myself. I don't know if I can. Is it possible for me to share those? If you if you're able to screen share, let's. Don't know that I am at the moment. Um, you see it? Can, can you see my screen share yet or not? Oh, I think it's doing something. Um, if if people uh, go on to the the sort of the gallery view, there should be three dots at the top of Phil's square. Um, if you click on that and select Hidden Video. Uh, then you should get Phil filling your screen. Not sure that's a good thing. No. <laughs> How's that work? Any thumbs up if you've, if you've managed to get that to work? No? Is it not going? 
I've just got Phil on my screen, if that helps. I have Phil. I have Phil, got as well. Phil, but we haven't got your screen, so. Okay. Um, try, you we, we, the bottom of that, there's a green arrow pointing up that says share screen. Right, let me have a. Oh. It's telling me that I can't share the screen while other participant is sharing. That is because I think Sarah has accidentally shared her screen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, yeah, if you want to try again now, Phil. April, if you're sharing yours, you might need to. Oh, no. Is that yeah, working? There we go. Look at that. Excellent. Sorry, folks got there eventually. Uh, yeah, so just uh, as we said, um, it's, uh, it's a recap for people because you know, already know this information, but it does give you a few pointers. Um, let me just... There we go. So we've already spoken about the, um, the positives that social media has. Um, and as we know, it helps promote those positive messages about football in general, and of course about your own clubs or leagues that you're involved with. Um, it gives us also a great opportunity to engage with a very broad and diverse audience as we already looked at today. Um, but it also, and it also can, when you're uh, dealing with the structures within your own clubs, it also plays an important part in communicating with your players and the membership of your clubs. So, because um, maybe it's more linked to, to, to my generation, sometimes people do have a fear of social media and of the digital world and really one of the key messages that, that, that I have to push out and I know it's uh, fully endorsed by um, CEOP and other such people is actually not to be afraid of it because it really has some really positives um, and, and key positive messages for us in football um, and we should be embracing it most definitely as I'm sure all of you are but we must also remember that we must use it responsibly. So some key considerations just to, to, to keep in mind um, when you're managing your social media um, within your clubs, really this, this, this focuses in on a lot, but the key considerations are, you know, you must think about appointing an appropriate adult to monitor the media content that's going out there, making sure that it's um, uh, age appropriate where necessary. And also obviously um, that nothing is being posted that's offensive or, or, or rude or, and, and anything like that needs to be needs to be challenged and dealt with very very quickly okay we also say asking football that um, all clubs consider placing the SEOP report abuse app on their website uh, a fantastic tool to help keep our young people safe uh, it gives them the opportunity without um, without any hesitation of hitting that reporting button and reporting um, content that they see that gives them that causes them concern and it's, it goes straight through to uh, the law enforcement experts who um, who then take a look at it um, and it bypasses all of us and and takes out all those time delays um, and gives our young people confidence when they're when they're using uh, the, the digital uh, you know digital world in football um, have a look at your privacy settings, make sure they're locked um, where necessary to make sure that the stuff that's being put out in your name, as it were, uh, is only the stuff that you want to be put out and relates to your, your club or your league that you're involved in. Um, and remember, if, you're, if we're talking about um, images, uh, particularly around under 18s or indeed engaging with under 18s anyway, we need to have um, signed uh, consent from their parents, guardians, carers, uh, to make sure that they're, that they're happy for this to, to take place. Um, and again, to make sure that we operate um, you know, responsibly, um, please keep your group messaging, especially when you're messaging uh, the under 18s, uh, that needs to be open. And again, we need to have it monitored by people who are responsible adults. Generally, it's going to be hopefully um, your parents' carers of that young person. Um, but sometimes that can be other adults within the club, responsible adults, again, to um, sort of police that messaging that goes out there and, and to challenge any, any, any inappropriate messages that, um, that crop up in, in amongst your media. Few, few um, pointers on the don'ts as well. So please, again, um, you know, we are about safeguarding our young people and some of our young people playing football within our clubs uh, are protected um, either through court orders or um, they may be adopted children, etc. So they have particular concerns around them and people um, identifying who they are and where they are. So please don't post any um, 
personal details of under 18s, which may lead them to them being contacted or identified. Um, and again, this is keeping them safe from those, uh, those predators that do exist in our society, sadly. Um, adults must not friend or engage in private conversations with under 18s. Um, on the occasions that this does happen, this is very much related to, to boundaries, which you should all be familiar with. Um, when we get uh, coaches or people within clubs who start to privately message, uh, and it may be from their perspective for, for purely innocent purposes in the, in the beginning, that, that's, that's a blurring of those boundaries and it's a really dangerous area to get into. So please uh, don't tempt fate uh, and make sure that all your volunteers within your club don't get drawn into that and, and start engaging with under 18s in private conversations or friending them um, on, you know, through social media. Um, and as, as we would all do, please, um, we need to have a zero toler tolerance on that, uh, any offensive or abusive messaging that comes out, you know, in certain circumstances, some of that will lead to, uh, well, can be criminal offences, but was, could, could well lead to discipline type um, charges being brought against you uh, by the footballing authorities if we find that they're um, discriminatory for example uh, or really abusive so again but that's the idea of having um, those responsible adults monitoring those groups um, to make sure that the, the the messaging that goes out there is appropriate and as I say on the odd occasion it does happen uh, and it may be a young person that, that posts something that's inappropriate or offensive or abusive it needs to be challenged and dealt with swiftly and promptly to to to, to um, you know, reinforced this message of zero tolerance around those those type of posts. Um, and finally, a football specific one. Um, please all remind be reminded that uh, we shouldn't be posting or hosting match results for uh, any teams under eleven or downwards. That is against uh, FA uh, guidelines. Okay. Uh, at that age group, it's very much development football, and we're not focusing on the result. We're focusing on them developing. So posting up of um, uh, results becomes um, uh, quite contentious, so uh, the FA say no to that, please. That's a very, very quick rundown of uh, what the key points are uh, around the FA's guidance. If you want the full guidance, uh, that's where you'll find them there. Um, the FA safeguarding guidance notes now run to 108, so I've narrowed it down for you. They're the three you want. <laughs> the guidance notes on the website is 6.1, um, which gives you further guidance around running websites and social media platforms. Uh, guidance notes 6.2 is around a digital, digital communications with children, um, i.e. under 18. And then the other one, which sort of overlaps all of these, um, it's worth having a look well as, as well at the guidance note 8.3, which is photographing and filming children. And you'll see at the bottom there that the, uh, the link I've posted there takes you to the page where you'll find all of those um, guidance notes for you, for your information. And then last but by no means least, there are, it's not just within football, we have other organisations that um, have some absolutely fantastic resources, both for the young people and for, for the adults, um, around um, staying safe uh, online. Um, obviously, you'll all be familiar with the NSPCC. They have two great campaigns. One is NetAware. NetAware tends to focus around um, information for parents and adults around uh, information about how to keep our, our young people safe. And the ShareAware stuff, um, which is created by the NSPCC, um, they have, you know, it's, it's uh, created for the young people themselves and actually for very young children. And I, I've um, I've bored them to death in the office with uh, Pantasaurus and the cartoons that they've created there, which are hugely appealing to, to um, the very young children. And I'm talking sort of perhaps um, under 11, something like that and below. Uh, and But it's a really clear, simple messaging in a format that they'll understand. So, yeah, please have a look at Share Aware. That's a great resource for the young people themselves. Childnet, um, another organisation that give fantastic advice around staying safe uh, online. SEOP, which I mentioned earlier, so I didn't explain, that is the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Unit. Uh, they are the leading law enforcement agency in the UK uh, who lead on um, safety of children, both online and offline, actually. And they have um, an education branch, which is Think You Know there. So if you go on to the Think You Know um, page, again, you'll find uh, free online resources um, and courses that uh, are age appropriate that um, we can do to give us guidance on how to stay safe online. So it ranges from, I think, about four years old um, through to adults as well. So well worth having a look at their website. And then lastly, at Young Stonewall as well. 
um, which focuses on um, you know the issues that uh, can occur and arise around our LGBT communities um, and where they can find support um, and, and extra resources there. Uh, and that's it from me. So that's a, a very brief run through. If anyone's got any questions, please let me know. Brilliant. Thanks, Phil. Um, so if you are able to, I think you stopped sharing your screen there, April, if you could possibly get up the, um, your screen. There we go. Lovely stuff. Cool. Right. I'm just going to really, really quickly run you through a couple of uh, potentially useful resources um, which you can make use of uh, within the club. Um, so first of all, um, we, we get a lot of stuff come through on social media, people, uh, clubs tagging us in, asking us to share uh, sort of new player opportunities. Uh, obviously, we can't do that for every single club. Um, otherwise, our feed would just be full of that and we'd, we'd just be constantly churning it out. Um, what we have done, though, is create a player notice board on our website um, and we can send this out within the resource pack to you. Um, and essentially, it's a place uh, to, di to um, direct players towards and we'll be getting encouraging clubs to use it so you can share information about the club if you're looking for, for new players um, and that's something that the resource pack will also help with so, so there'll be some graphics in there that you can actually use and adapt for your club uh, to share because obviously it looks, looks a bit better when you've, when you've got an image there rather than just text. Um, so just very briefly on that um, and also we'll be publicising that quite a lot when we, when we know when we can get back to playing football uh, we'll be sharing that quite, quite a lot across social media so hopefully a lot of traffic will land on that page. Um, move on now to Sporting Connect. Um, so we recently teamed up with um, a company called Sporting Connect, they're Surrey based, um, and we've developed a Surrey FA version of the website. Um, and the idea for this is it can be used by clubs and by coaches. Uh, for clubs, it's free to share um, volunteer opportunities, and for coaches, it's free to find um, volunteer coaching opportunities and the same for physios as well um, obviously there is a, a sort of a, um, a premium function to it if you're looking for paid jobs and so professional jobs um, and likewise if you want to kind of publicize and boost your, your job post uh, there's a sort of a paid element to that as well um, again we'll be sending information on that out in the resource pack um, but if you have any questions about that please do ping me over an email um, I think it could be really really useful if I know a lot of clubs are looking for new coaches for the new season um, and it's, it's a really useful tool that will hopefully get quite, quite a strong user base um, in the coming months. Um, so if you just uh, look for James Chadwick, Surrey FA in Google or go onto our staff contact page, uh, you'll find my contact details there. Move on now to um, the resource packs, this is what I've mentioned. Um, I will let April talk through some of this because uh, it's, it's hype marketing that have created these lovely resources for us. Um, but the, the logic behind these is um, a, a couple of things. So on the left, you'll see that's a sort of a club re recruitment template for you to use. Um, so a little bit of information about your team, you can add your social media handles in there, insert a, a club photo, just hopefully something that's, that's quite sleek and consistent for you to use. Um, obviously, as I've said, that's something you could sort of uh, use on the player notice board as well. Um, we've also got the, uh, the player of the match, so you can use that as well, um, and a graphic where you can put up your scores, but only Phil, if those players are over the age of 11, um, can you share that? So um, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to that, April. Um I, we've made them all in PowerPoint, so everybody should be able to use them. Um, and they're all really, really simple. In the actual document, I've kind of said how you can change the background to your colours, and basically, if, if it doesn't quite fit, what you can do. Um, but yeah, that that would be it. We've got some square ones as well for Instagram. Um, so, so hopefully, you guys will find them really, really useful. Yeah, and just worth saying for anyone that doesn't have PowerPoint in their computer, you can. Um, upload the file into Google Slides, uh, which is free to use and basically has the same functionality as PowerPoint. So you can you can use that, and then you can just export from PowerPoint to an image. And I think April, that's all in the resource pack, isn't it? It is indeed. So everything is explained 
um, an idiot's guide. <laughs> Took me a little while to work it out, so <laughs> careful what you say, James. <laughs> um, as I said, if if anyone does have any questions, kind of following up, you might even have some as a result of kind of receiving the information from myself. Um, obviously, feel feel free to send us through any questions on that as well, and um, if you want to um, sort of go into any more detail offline. Uh, yeah, likewise. If anyone's got any um, around Mo Valley, if they've got any specific queries around how we've uh, produced things or done anything or anything like that, then just uh, you can contact me using the contact form on um, mvgfc.co.uk. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to help out with any anything practical or or whatever. <laughs>